Hello everyone, welcome to our talk. I will present our work Nor Marching Cubes. I am Jitian Chen, one of the authors, and the other author is my PhD supervisor Richard. We are from Simon Fraser University in Canada. In this talk, I will explain the issues of classical marching cubes, how we tackle the issues, the details of our approach, Nora Marching Cubes, or AMC for short, and experiments, results, limitation, and future work. First, let me introduce marching cubes to you. It is the most popular algorithm for isosurface extraction. And the input to marching cubes is a discretized implicit field, which is a uniform grid of scalar values, such as sign distances, occupancies. Marching cubes processes each cube in the grid individually and uses a lookup table to decide the mesh translation in each cube, as shown in the figure below. On the right, you can see the lookup table from the original marching cubes paper, which contains the mesh translation templates for 15 unique cases with respect to rotation and inverting the signs. At runtime, marching cubes will process one cube at a time. For each cube, it will copy one of those templates while adjusting the positions of the edge vertices according to some rules. So what are the issues of marching cubes? First of all, it cannot recover sharp features. You can see the output of marching cubes and the ground truth at the bottom, where it's obvious that all the sharp edges are not properly reconstructed by marching cubes. And the reason is quite simple. If you look at the tessellation templates of marching cubes, you will find that they are not able to represent sharp edges or corners inside the cube. There are isosurfacing algorithms that can recover sharp features, but they all require additional inputs. So you might wonder, if the templates are the reasons why marching cubes cannot reconstruct sharp features, we can just design more complicated templates, right? Not really, let me show you the second issue, that marching cubes is model-driven, meaning that the mesh topology in each cube and the vertex positions are decided by a set of manually designed rules. Usually the rules follow the trilinear interpolant assumption. It assumes the implicit field inside each cube follows trilinear interpolation with respect to the values of its eight corner vertices. We show the trilinear interpolant of the input grid here. And as you can see, it's quite different from the actual ground truth, as shown on the right. Those variants of marching cubes that have this trilinear interpolant assumption treat this trilinear interpolant as their ground truth. So there is a paper by Lobs and Bodley in 2003, where they actually designed more complicated tessellation templates, able to represent sharp features. But because they also followed this trilinear interpolant assumption, their result is even smoother than the original marching cubes. This is because they treat the trilinear interpolant as their ground truth. The trilinear interpolant assumption affects not only the positions of the vertices, but also the topology in each cube. You can see the clear artifacts produced by marching cube 33 and the method by Lobson and Bodley compared to the ground truth. This is because the trilinear interpolant of the input grid looks exactly like this, and it is not correct. So to summarize, marching cubes has the following issues. Its templates cannot represent sharp features, and it relies heavily on the trilinear interpolant assumption. So what can we do? For the first one, we can either design new templates or use existing templates that can better represent geometric features. The second one is harder to solve. Suppose we have those better templates. How do we define the rules to decide what is the topology inside the cube, and where to put the vertices? The answer is we don't. We will let the algorithm learn those rules by itself with the help of machine learning and a lot of training data. The key challenge to that is how we represent the output mesh. How can we use a neural network to predict the topology in each cube and the positions of the vertices in an efficient way? Here is a naive example that is not efficient. Due to the timing of this video, I will skip this part but you are welcome to pause the video and think of it. I have also listed a few problems of this example here. To summarize our paper, Normal Marching Cubes, we design efficient and compatible per cube parameterization to represent the output triangle mesh. We then design transition templates so that they can better preserve geometric features 
while being compatible to the per queue parameterization above. Finally, we process the training data and design the network and the loss functions. Let me start with two examples. Here are the phase tessellations of marching cubes. This is an exhaustive list, and there are a total of 18 cases, including two ambiguous cases as shown here. They have the same signs on the corner vertices, but we can't decide whether to connect the positive dots or the negative dots. Also, it's obvious that these templates are not able to represent chart features. So we add additional vertices into the templates. Note that the additional vertices are corresponded with the corner vertices, indicated by the same colors. For example, this one here, and this one here. This design is to help us parameterize those cases more efficiently, as shown here. As you see, with such design, no matter what topological case this square belongs to, we only need to store four face vertices and four edge vertices. Also, they are symmetric with respect to rotation, mirroring, and inverting the signs. On the right, you can see how this square can be stored into a vector with a fixed length, despite the topological cases. We divide this vector into two parts, a boolean part that stores binary values, and a float part to store float point numbers. The purpose of the boolean part is to store the topological case of this square. Since most of the cases are unambiguous, they can be identified by the four signs on the corners. But there are two ambiguous cases here, so we add a face sign. The face sign indicates whether the two positive vertices connect or the two negative vertices connect. In an ambiguous case, the face sign is positive if the positive vertices connect, and vice versa. With that, we have stored the 18 cases into 5 binary values. Now let's look at the float part, which is used to store vertex positions. The edge vertices have 1 degree of freedom each, so 4 float numbers for 4 edge vertices. The face vertices have 2 degrees of freedom each, so 8 float numbers for 4 face vertices. In total, we need 5 binary values and 12 float numbers to store a square. Now let's think about 2D marching cubes, or marching squares, where we use a neural network to predict the outputs. The input would be n by n, a 2D grid. And the output would be n by n by 5 for the boolean part, and n by n by 12 for the float part. But there are redundancies. For example, for corner signs, we only need to store this one, because this one will be stored in this adjacent square, and this one in this square and this one in this square. After removing the duplicates, the actual output would be n by n by 2 for the boolean part, and n by n by 10 for the float part. Now we can use a network to predict those values. In this case, a simple CNN will do. The parameterization for a cube is similar to that of a square, but it is not easy to visualize, so these figures are a bit messy. Let's just count how many additional vertices we have here. We have one edge vertex for each edge, so 12 edge vertices. There are six faces, and each face has four face vertices, so 24 face vertices. Also, for each of the corner vertices, we introduce a corresponding interior vertex, just like those in 2D. So we have eight interior vertices, and that's all. Note that the face vertices and the interior vertices have correspondences with the corner vertices, just like those in 2D. And similarly, we can design the parameterization for a cube. One thing to note here is that we have a tunnel flag in the 3D case. It indicates whether there is a tunnel inside the cube, which we will show later. To summarize, in a 3D neural marching cubes, the input would be m by m by k, and output would be n by n by k by 5 for the boolean part, and n by n by k by 51 for the float part. Now that we have those additional vertices, we can design tessellation templates for 3D cubes. We have implemented a simple UI to aid the tessellation design, as shown here. Since we already have 2D face templates, the face tessellations of this cube is given at the beginning. 
So we just need to design the inner structures. This example shows how to make a tunnel. Note that the corner signs and the face tessellations are identical to the previous example. The only difference is that this time we are going to connect the two regions, or in other words, make a tunnel. Here are our design tessellation templates. To compare, these are the templates used in Marching Cube 33. And in the paper by Lopes and Bodley. Note that this method and Marching Cube 33 both have 31 unique cases with respect to rotation, mirroring, and inverting the signs. Ours has 37 unique cases. So we have added six cases to this set of templates, and then we can use them in our network. Since these templates are simpler than ours, we call our method that uses this set of templates as an MC light, and our method with our templates as an MC. Our method is data-driven, so it should work with different tessellations. After we have the templates, we can start processing the data. That is, we need to convert a mesh into a grid of sign distances of voxels as input. And we also need to convert the mesh into these regular grid outputs for training the network. This is done by sampling a dense point cloud for each cube from the ground truth mesh, and minimizing the chamfer distance between the point cloud and the template. After that, we use a 3D ResNet as a network, and use binary cost entropy loss to train the boolean part, and mean square error loss to train the fault part. If the inputs are binary voxels, we also have addition of smoothness term. The effect of the smoothness term is shown here. Because if the inputs are binary voxels, the ambiguity of the output is too strong. So we have to add a smoothness term to regularize that. Now the experiment part. We have trained our network on 80% of the first chunk of the BC dataset. We only discretize the data into 32 cubic and 64 cubic resolution for training. And we train individual models for SDF grid and the voxel grid input. For testing, we have 20% of ABC first chunk. We also have 2000 shapes from CI10K dataset to test the generalizability of our model on new datasets. And we have 100 shapes from FAUST to test our model on organic shapes. Here are the results. Our model outperforms others. Feel free to pause and look at the numbers. Here are the results when the inputs are SDF grids. The first two columns show the results of Marching Cube 33 and the method by Lopes and Bodley. The next two columns show our results, NMC and NMC Lite. Our model can predict the right topology, preserve sharp features, and even perform better on smooth features. Here are the results when the inputs are voxel grids. 
you can see the clear difference between classical methods and learning-based methods. If you have experimented with the ABC dataset, which is our training set, you will know that it contains only CAD models for mechanical parts. It does not have any organic shapes. Although our model is not trained on organic shapes, it works surprisingly well on them, as shown in this results on false dataset. Here are the numbers showing our model outperforming the others. Here we saw the results of our model when tested on different resolutions. We have also tested our model on noisy inputs. Our model trained on clean data generates artifacts, but can still outperform the others. Since our model is data-driven, we could just train the network with noisy data, and it can produce better results. There are a few issues of our current approach. First, it may produce artifacts when the input is oriented at an unusual angle relative to the training shapes. This is expected because our model learns from data. Performing data augmentation and introducing more training data could alleviate the issue. Second, MC cannot reconstruct some topological cases by design, which also happens to classical marching cubes. For example, when you have two intersection points on an edge, that constitute an invalid cube and cannot be reprinted by MC. And it leads to artifacts as shown here. Third, MC does not have a mechanism to avoid self-intersections. They usually appear in the cubes that cannot be reprinted by MC. For example, if you zoom in this part, there are plenty of self-intersections. Finally, the inference speed of MC is far from real-time, with most of the time spent on network forwarding, because we have a huge network working on 3D grids. For future work, we have this neural door countering on DC to solve some of the aforementioned issues. NDC takes the same input as an MC. It is based on dual countering, therefore much easier to implement. It produces less triangles and vertices with better triangle quality. It has less values to predict for each cube, so that we can use a smaller network. Therefore, the training and inference are much faster than an MC. It guarantees no self-intersections, but may produce non-manifold edges. It cannot reconstruct some cube cases. And here are some results. You can see that NDC uses less triangles with better triangle quality compared to MC, and it is still able to reconstruct sharp features. The code and data of AMC and NDC are available on GitHub. Here are the links to our paper and personal websites. Thank you for watching.